Hello, thank you for participating to this uh, uh, webinar uh, about interventional radiology. So I'm very pleased to introduce you the, the three other speakers with uh, Lombros, Celicas, and Frédéric Deschamps from uh, Institut Gustave Rossi in Paris. And we have in live uh, Dr. Mark Lennon from University of Colorado. And uh, I am Vincent Vidal from Marseille, uh, interventional radiologist in France also. So we are going directly to the first presentation, which is uh, my lectures. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, complex IR procedures with a robotic assistant. Um, so here is a setup in Marseille. So you know, uh, when you just enter in the room, you can have your own cockpit with uh, this uh, tool. And I'm going to show you uh, prosthetic arterial embolizations because I think it's one of the cases which is complex. But also the anatomy, the, the length of the procedure, the dose uh, delivery by the, the device. Um, let me show you. So all the video are real-time video. So I begin uh, usually on the left with uh, 3D acquisitions. So you see there is a white board, so we don't take care of the, the arm of the patient. I just do the setup for the rotation here. And here is the rotations in the uh, real time. So I have uh, with that directly the, I am working directly in the room. You see, uh, I have the mouse in my hand and I am working here on the reconstruction. So on the left, I will show you, on the right, the next after I'm going to show you all the process, but here you see that I, sorry, I am uh, looking at the uh, artery. So it's interesting to see that in this case, uh, sorry, in this case, on the left, uh, you have a, a view, which is an Ontario view, and you cannot, it's more difficult to see that there is two artery. On the right, you have an uh, axial view, and here you see very well that you have a posterior and an anterior artery. So that means on the left, you have two uh, prostatic ar artery, which is not common, but which happens. And here you see uh, we are going to begin to do the embolizations of the uh, posterior uh, prostatic artery. So you see on the right uh, picture the, the tract of the artery. And uh, you can see at the end of the embolization that we see a uh, small uh, reflex in the pudendal artery, which is the more anterior artery. And here you see the catheterism of the pudendal with a pudendal uh, accessory artery, which uh, goes directly to uh, the uh, prostatic artery. So of course you cannot inject from here some spheres because it will go uh, directly in the pudendal artery. So the goal of that is to go as to come as close as possible of the distal part of the anastomosis, you see on the picture of the left. Uh, and when you come as close as possible, you can occlude this anastomosis, usually with cores. Here it's a very small cores of 2.5 uh, millimeters. So uh, the 3D uh, for me, uh, for prostatic artery, is very interesting to depict um, different arteries or arteries coming from uh, femoral, uh, superficial femoral, or this kind of things uh, which can be a little uh, tricky. So embolizations has been done of the anastomosis, and now uh, I can do the embolizations of the other part of the parenchyma. So this is for the left. So for the right, uh, I'm going to do uh, the same things, uh, uh, rotations, obtain the 3D embolizations, and here you have a video where you can see here the real time. So this is the first reconstruction. I am going to click on the vessel to extract. You can see on the bottom the, the green light to extract all the vascular vessel of the hypogastric. Uh, so here I'm going to select the extraction of the vessel. So you see the reconstruction time, which takes 15 minutes around. And now I can play and look where is the territory of the prosthetic artery. So that means that I'm going to select here the artery, and this is the real time, you can see on the upper uh, left images, what is the territory. So I have chosen this territory, I can now select here, you see this is the yellow artery which has been selected. I am looking if it's really good, if it's uh, the real good positions. I am going to 
ask to have some more artery upper to help my catheterization. Okay, I have the good one, so now I'm going to transfer it in the room. So the interesting point here, that I am still in the room, I have not a uh, chain of room, and here is the visual, uh, direct visualizations. I'm going to choose here which volume I want to have. This is the volume of the artery. I am working on the opacity to have less opacity, and now I have the volume of the artery. So that means I don't have to know the anatomy, I don't have to do anything. And I have the artery, I have to select it. So when you turn, of course, with the 3D, it turns with you. When you zoom, when you move, it moves with you. So it gives really the very nice opportunity to do catheterizations. And you see here with the microcatheter, now you have here the wire passing in an artery, which is not the good one, but you can come as close as possible of these divisions and now change the orientations of the microcatheter and of the microwire to do the selections of the prostatic artery. Here you see, we pass through the prostatic artery and that means you can go as close as possible. Okay, so this is very useful to have this kind of 3D CT with uh, this roadmap to do the embolizations. Of course, when you have done the embolization, when you are ready to do that, you can do a 3D CT like I'm doing here on the video to be sure that you have only prostate, prostate parenchyma to embolize. So here you see the reconstruction, still the next reconstruction. So here you have the time of reconstruction and this is the injection. You see the coils on the left and on the right the parenchyma of the prostate, there is only prostate, so you can do the embolizations. So this is real time of, of doing this kind of uh, using of uh, embo assist, which is really, really interesting. You see on the left the dose, which is real time dose. Here you have this uh, blue uh, color code. Okay, so finally here the positionment of the microcatheter and final embolizations. So I think for, for me, which is really interesting uh, with uh, Alia, is uh, to have an easy CBCT acquisitions because at the beginning it was not so easy to do acquisitions and finally if you have to move the arm of the patient, you have to do plenty of things, it's complicated. Uh, I am at the table side, I don't move from the table side, I have to ask no one to do some things. I can do my image fusions and with the, the, the control of the dose, I have the right image for the right dose. Okay, so there are already some questions. The, one of the, the first questions is uh, what type of other equipment do you have in your eye hair department? So we have a specific market uh, with General Electric. That means we have uh, uh, five rooms. One room is dedicated to new role interventional radiology. Three rooms are dedicated to peripheral, so we have Alia and we have uh, other IGS, IGS, and we have uh, General Electric um, CT, Interventional uh, CT scan. So, is that other question? So, who is performing the planning with AMBO Assist? An operator in, or in the control room? So no, no, my, my goal is that uh, we have no operator in the control room, uh, no techs. The techs are with us, they are working with us, giving, uh, uh, taking care of the patients, giving the materials, and, all, and I do my own uh, planning with Ambo Assist. That means that I know what I have in my mind, I know what I want to do, so I go quicker, I don't have to ask, I don't have to even to cry or to do those kind of things. So clearly for me it's really better. Uh, other questions? No, so we have to... Either, yes, uh, last questions. How is it to use the touch panel with gloves or sterile drapes? Um, clearly, I have no, it gives no problem. We have uh, the mouse. I don't, I'm just not think that I am with uh, gloves. So it's clearly the same thing that if you are at your desk. Is there some other questions? Uh, what is the typical dose you normally end up with uh, for uh, a PAA? So on 
it's, which is interesting, on, on the left part of the screen you have this color code. It looks like uh, when you are in a car, uh, when you go as fast as possible, you, you see it's do the dose you delivery. Um, so we have an alarm which is um, free gray to, to the skin. Uh, usually, and now it's like a, a challenge for us, the, the one who is going to, to, to deliver the less dose. And usually we, we try to the prosthetic for 30% to 40% of free gray. So that means one, 1.5 gray, which is really not a lot. Uh, usually it's uh, four uh, rotative acquisitions uh, and we use a lot, uh, I haven't shown that because we don't have time, but the uh, numeric uh, zoom, magnific magnificent, which is uh, really useful. Um, what is the ramp up period to feel confident using this system? Um, clearly you have seen this was a, 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 the video I shown is a real time video. so. Um, it's really easy and I don't know for you but uh, uh, it's really intuitive uh, you just have to click on, on the vessel and there is only perhaps four or five link to obtain the, the complete um, the complete uh, planning so for uh, Amboasis clearly it's not complicated is there other questions in the audience no Okay. Would, you, yeah. would you recommend not doing the selective 3D before embolization and trusting only the, the, the system? Uh, or you think it's ev even important to, to do it uh, to look at uh, branches you don't want to embolize? Yeah, I, I, I feel more and more confident. So sometimes I can say, okay, I'm not going to do, but I think it's better to do. It's not a lot of those. And clearly, it and it gives a good uh, report. Uh, if you have any kind of troubles after of uh, non-target embolizations, clearly you can say at the beginning of the procedure. Clearly, I was in the good positions. Perhaps uh, you had a backflow or things, but so um, I do it. I do it. I perform it. Okay, so we are going now to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is uh, Dr. Lombros Celikas. Thank you, Lombros. Thank you very much. So for the next presentation, we'll move to intraarterial therapies with liver assist virtual parenchyma and we'll focus on intervention and radiology for, for liver procedures and I'll focus mainly on radioembolization, but it can be applied also to chemoembolization. So there are many, many challenges when you perform liver in, intraarterial procedures that concern planning, targeting, but also assessing of the treatments and by having all these tools, those, these softwares, and this uh, useful um, help from the machine, you can see how you can identify the targets, the tumors themselves, then the, the tumor feeding vessels, how to go to the target, and then finally, and it's very important, to define the proper injection points, and at the end, to be able to assess the success of the treatment delivery, and if possible, being able to do it before doing the injection. So we'll see can we, how we can answer to all these key points using the, the available material. So there are many solutions to overcome, to overcome all these challenges. The first one, as uh, Professor Vidal just said, it's very convenient to have a, a white bore in, o in order to have the, the maximum of comfort for the patient, but also for the operator, meaning that you can perform your 3D acquisition without taking care of the positioning of the arms, the, the centering of the patients. So you just need to adapt the height of the table just to be able to make a good 3D acquisition. But also, when you have a white ball and a, a, a large uh, panel, you can have a good anatomical coverage. You can see on one acquisition, you can have the entire liver on your images. But then you, you can apply softwares that can even help you to have better images and to go further with your intraarterial procedures. For instance, you have Motion Freeze, which is a, a software that allows to compensate the involuntary respiratory motion, and I'll show you why it's important. And finally, you have all the, the solutions that will help you to guide, to, to predict, to, to better select the embolization points that you will choose for each patient. So this is just an example, a patient, you, Clearly, there are artifacts, there are respiratory artifacts, and you can see on the left, 
without motion freeze and on the right with motion freeze. It's still not perfect, but there is a, a real important difference. Actually, on the, with the left image without motion freeze, you cannot use the most advanced software possibilities that you have that will help you to see the, the, the pathway to the tumor to make your, your mobilization. While when you use motion freeze, although there are still some artifacts, you can very clearly see depicted in green the, 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 the trajectory to your tumor. So it helps you not only to have better images, but to use the available softwares and to do better treatments for your patients. Then, the next step is how to use liver assist vir virtual parenchyma. In a CBCT acquisition, you can see the segmentation of the, the liver volume in blue, which is an eye-based uh, software and algorithm that allows you very, with pretty much good confidence to have very rapidly the liver volume. And then you can navigate on all the branches you have extracted to see which branch feeds your, the tumor and depending on where you will select your injection point, what's the parenchyma that will be impacted by your injection. So it's very easy to identify the vessels in real time and have a, a, a virtual um, estimation of the treated liver parenchyma. Then we, we did a, a, a trial comparing, a study comparing the results of virtual, virtual parenchyma and the ground truth, which, which was a manual segmentation of selected convenient CTs. And you can see there is a very good concordance with a volume relative error, which was quite low, 12%. And then DICE overlap index, that means that all the pixels were the same as uh, proposed by the virtual parenchyma software and the manual um, delimitation, in, in which was 80%. So it's very good for this kind of softwares. And let me share with you three examples. The first one is a 75 years old patient with a neuroendocrine tumor with a liver mat. You can see it's a segment four and it's, there is a risk of bile duct compression. The tumor board opted for radioembolization. In our center, we do both global and selective convenient CT acquisition. You have your five fresh catheter in the celiac trunk or the hepatic artery. You can, uh, you can inject 30 milliliters of contrast with a flow rate of three ml per sec. And then you need to have a small delay to be able to see the vessels, but also the tumor and the parenchyma. And then when you go further and more selectively, you, of course, you decrease the volume of contrast that you're injecting and the, the flow rate, and you increase the delay in order to have a good parenchymography. So this is a workup of the radioembolization. So very rapidly, we are in the celiac trunk. You can see the images of the angel, the 2D angel. There is a right replaced artery, so this is only the left liver. The 3D acquisition that we, we do almost systematically for these kind of procedures, real time. And then you have the reconstructions that allows you to extract both the tumor and the vessels. Then by clicking on the software, you have the pathway to your tumor, so you have detected your feeders. Then you can move on, on, with the mouse on the vessels and define which is the best uh, point to make your injection. So it allows you to simulate the treatment virtually. Then you can superimpose these images to your real-time fluoro images to help you with the catheterization. And once you have selected your branch, this is Quite, we're quite close, but there is still a branch go lower. Then we went more selectively, and here you can see we're very precisely in the branch of the segment four that vascularized the tumor. So we're happy with that. We, we made the injection of the, of the olmium quirum spheres. So, and those are the images from the SPECT CT that correlates perfectly with what has been computed by a virtual parenchyma. Another example, eight years old female, cholangiocarcinoma, she was contraindicated for anesthesia, so we, we, we could not go for surgery, neither for percutaneous ablation. So once again, the tumor board decided to go for radioembolization. And this is the, the angel, the 2D angel. And of course, the 3D, there are some artifacts, but still you can depict the two branches that are computed by the machine that shows the, the vascularization of the tumor. And we did the same work on both branches and you can see in the upper one, you have the parenchyma that is concerned by the injection, 
and the tumor that is encompassed by this uh, injection point. And although the second injection point also concerns a small part of the tumor, there is a lot of non-tumoral parenchyma that will be targeted. So because the patient was fragile, she was uh, ECOG 2, 80, 80 years old, and we wanted to make a quick procedure and not treat that much of non-tumoral parenchyma, we decided to treat just one point, one injection point. You can see the selective catheterization with a good tumoral uptake. And we did the selective the 3D acquisition, and you can see the correlation. The, the virtual parenchyma software computed a volume of one, 176 centimeters cube, and the manual segmentation computed a volume on, of 166 centimeters cube. So a very close, a very good correlation of, the, of these two virtual and real-time imaging. And on the right part of the images, you can see the, the spec CT that confirms the deposition of the querium scutes. Finally, last example, a patient with a melanoma metastasis. It was an oligomet patient with a non-hypervascularized tumor, but still it works. If you put your region of interest on the tumor, you can see the software depicts the, the, the feeders and proposes two injection points. And you can very clearly see the correlation of what is proposed by, by the software and the real-time 2D angels that with the microcaster, you have a perfect match of all the branches that will be conserved by the injection. Of course, you have also the correlation on the volumes, and we did that for both the, f the first and the second injection points. You can see the images with the virtual caster, which your mouse clicked on the, on the vessels, and the real microcaster, which is in place for the injection. And you have the visualization of the, of the parenchyma that will be concerned by the injections. So finally, there are, there, are, there are very important advantages by using this workflow. With your whiteboard CRM, you can easily perform your CD acquisi CT acquisitions. You can use softwares to improve the quality of the images, namely motion freeze to, to reduce the respiratory artifacts. And then you can take uh, the, the plenty usefulness of a liver cyst virtual parenchyma to identify the vessels simulate your injection points in real time and evaluate the, the parenchyma that will be concerned by your, by, by your injection. So this is how we perform nowadays liver, intra-arterial liver procedures. Thank you very much and if there are any questions, I'm glad to take them. Thank you, Lambros. So the first question in the audience is, uh, you talk about anatomical coverage. What is the size of the general electric detector in your place? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Actually, we are, we're an oncological center, so we want our large uh, panel. So it's a 40-40, so 40 centimeters uh, on both sides, actually. It's a square. And it allows us to, to have th this very nice coverage of uh, all the anatomical regions. Okay. I think at your place... In, in, in our place, we do vascular and oncology, and we have 30-30. And there are, no, there are no limitations to do oncology with 30. Okay. Um, other questions in the audience? Um, um, what is it, it's the same questions? But what is the RAM period to feel comfortable uh, using uh, ASIS virtual parenchyma? Actually, I, w I share the, the same experience as, as you, you described. Actually, it's pretty much intuitive. It's quite easy. We are, we were used to G softwares from the beginning, so we work with uh, with this kind of softwares for, for a long time now. So it's quite easy for both us and our technicians to get used to. But actually, you do five, four, five procedures, and then you get used to to the clicks and the and the pathways. So it's it's quite uh, quite easy to use. Okay. Um, who is usually performing the planning phase of liver assist virtual parenchyma? You or an operator? Actually, in our place, we don't have the alia yet. So, in our place, it's the, the technician, the operator, that performs this uh, planification. But still, as you see, it's, it's quite easy and feasible. So, you need to have them with you. They, they need to follow what you're doing in terms of uh, in the procedures to, to be helpful and don't waste time. But in our place, it's still the technicians that, that perform the, the planning and the, the, the selection of the, of the tumors, etc., etc. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, this software, Liver Assist Virtual Parenchyma, is only sold with a specific GU system. Is it uh, only sold for you? Uh, 
Uh, actually, w I don't know if I don't think it's available for uh, for other G systems for for non G systems, but you can apply it to to all the G systems. Actually, we have a an IGS where we have it. You can have it on yeah. the Elia. So I think you can have you can have it for all the the G, the G scale implementations. Yeah. Okay. Um, no more questions. Just wait two minutes to see if we have another questions. No other questions? Okay. So now, uh, thank you, Lombros, uh, Frédéric Deschamps, Dr. Frédéric Deschamps. Thank you for coming and we listen to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will talk about uh, advanced uh, percutaneous bone procedure. And for this purpose, I will show you a video of uh, a, a, a screw fixation. So this is about uh, a male suffering from a, a lung cancer and he has a very large osteolytic metastasis located in the pelvic and uh, specifically in the acetabulum so we have decided to perform a percutaneous procedure for both palliation and also uh, for consolidation. So for that we perform the procedure under general anesthesia and we have performed uh, an initial 3D acquisition that you can see in the middle uh, of the screen and on this 3D we use a software to plan three uh, trajectory that will be uh, then uh, superimposed on our uh, fluoroscopic uh, screen and that will help us to advance our needle uh, accordingly. We can see that uh, we are in the good direction and uh, if we reach the target point. We have also a software that can help us for, for, to, to, for, for this and uh, that will provide automatically uh, the bullseye view. Here for the second trajectory you can see the bullseye view which is uh, uh, display as a single point because the angulation of the C arm displays the, the trajectory uh, as a single point. So we try to puncture uh, the, the, uh, the second track using this uh, bullseye view. You can see here we are almost in the appropriate direction. We use a, a third, uh, a, a uh, gauge needle and then we move uh, to a progress view. Because it's bone, uh, we use a, a driller uh, to advance and you can see here I'm not exactly on the appropriate path so uh, I change my direction, I move the C arm through different angulation and uh, since I'm satisfied with this I can then uh, advance. So here we plan to um, uh, insert both cement and screw, so this is why we have this large bone metastasis. The last uh, trajectory is uh, uh, a little bit uh, more tricky because we can't have uh, a bullseye view, it is a very steep angulation, but uh, using different angulation we advance the needle and we check in different angulation. At this point, we want to assess that our needle is uh, uh, on the appropriate track. So there are two options to do that. We can either perform an additional 3D, uh, which is a good idea, but we can also uh, use a software to save uh, both time and radiation. This software is called uh, Stereo 3D. So I will explain it to you. We don't perform a 3D, but we will perform uh, two um, fluoroscopic shots at two different angulation, and the software will automatically uh, detect the, the needle that is close to my trajectory, and this uh, needle will be then uh, detected and uh, overlaid on the initial 3D uh, we have performed. So here are the uh, the 3D. You can see in green on the on the middle uh, uh, in the middle of the screen. This is the needle that has been automatically detected. So I can check the position of my needle with only two screen uh, two screenshots, and uh, not performing an additional 3D. So here, even if I'm not exactly on the plan trajectory, I can assess that my trajectory is still uh, good and I can uh, continue the procedure uh, 
uh, without an additional 3D. So you can see now the three needles that are almost in the appropriate uh, location. I just have to advance a, a little bit more each of them before uh, performing uh, the consolidation. The consolidation is uh, the, the, the last part of this uh, pr pr procedure. We will uh, not only inject cement, but we will perform something like a reinforced uh, cementoplasty for the, um, for the iliopubic uh, branch. What we will do is the injection of cement reinforced by a metallic pin. So you, you will see here the injection that we uh, manage under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. You can see the cement that exits uh, the, the needle. And then, before the consolidation of the cement, we advance uh, a metallic pin in the cement uh, that uh, will make something like a, a concrete, uh, reinforced concrete uh, bridge uh, for, for, for appropriate consolidation. Now for the iliac crest, we uh, will inject the cement so rapidly. Here we inject the cement through the first needle and through the second needle in the, in the same time. And we advance here a screw, which is a cannulated screw uh, in, in titan, before the consolidation of the cement. So this will make something very, very hard. And you can also see the injection of the cement and the pin insertion through the last uh, uh, track. The second part of the procedure for a very strong consolidation is performed on prone position. So we change the patient position. Uh, this is during the same anesthesia. So we have to perform a second 3D acquisition and we perform two new trajectory on this uh, 3D and these uh, two uh, trajectory are uh, again superimposed on the fluoroscopic screen. You can also see the red, uh, the bone the, uh, in red uh, that will help us to see any uh, motion that we can compensate uh, in real time. So here you can see that again I'm not exactly according to the plan trajectory so I will do again this uh, stereo 3D to see if I can continue this way or if I have to change. So I perform two fluoroscopic uh, shots at different angulation. This angulation are automatically, automatically computed by the software that help me to determine the, the appropriate uh, angulation. So here, uh, uh, here is the second one then the software will uh, depict on this image the location of my needle and then it will uh, um, e export this uh, needle, this virtual needle on uh, my initial 3D and you can see here in green where my needle is on the initial 3D. Of course I have to check that there is no motion uh, of the patient during this but I am on uh, gen uh, general anesthesia and there is no uh, motion. So here uh, I'm satisfied with this uh, trajectory, so I will continue advancing my needle and reach uh, my uh, target point. Again, I use this uh, um, uh, software to help me, so I have to advance a little bit more uh, to reach the target point. You can see that uh, everything is uh, fused with the movement of the sea arm. This is the, the first one and you, you will see the second one which is uh, even more tricky but it is because it's very a steep angulation as you can see here there is no way to have a bullseye view on, on this trajectory because we have some uh, collision with uh, the patient but thanks to different angulation we can uh, assess that we are in, in the appropriate uh, track. So I advance this needle uh, across the cement and the screw we have already injected so we have to be quite precise for this. 
And as soon as we are in a good position, then we can inject the cement. And you can see we are two operators here. Uh, one is injecting uh, through the first track. One will inject through the second track to have something that uh, uh, we will mix the cement coming from the two uh, needles. And uh, for the uh, ischiatic uh, track, we will inject uh, uh, we will ins inject cement and insert a screw within the cement before consolidation. And for the second one, we will again uh, insert a, a pin uh, in the cement. So here is the third 3D, the final one to check that uh, everything is okay. You can see a very a uh, strong consolidation with uh, uh, five uh, punctures. Uh, of course, we can see uh, this on uh, the software and um, uh, the, 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 um, the three D. Uh, you have here the axial plan, and we have uh, fulfilled the entire lytic metastasis. Uh, you can see the cement. You can see the three. Uh, pin within the cement and the two screws uh, and we make here a very uh, strong uh, consolidation. You have uh, now uh, the axial and we can see here the coronal uh, view um, again uh, <coughs> to show you uh, the, the, the final. So the patient uh, was discharged the day after the procedure. He uh, has a, a huge improve of the pain uh, within the two or three days after, after the procedure. And we have avoided uh, a large uh, surgical consolidation uh, for this patient uh, um, which, uh, who is uh, um, on, under uh, chemotherapy. So thank you. Thank you for these really amazing cases. Um, but we have uh, the first question. How, how accurate is the fusion system? Um, can you move the table without uh, losing uh, yeah, fusion? The, the, the system is very accurate and the fusion is uh, very precise. So we can move uh, the table without losing anything. Of course, if the patient moves, we have to compensate this uh, uh, movement thanks to the bone anatomy coming from the 3D, so we can translate or rotate to have uh, uh, the, the appropriate fusion. So th this works very well. How long take a case uh, like that? This Today. one took uh, something like two hours, but we have to change the position. So, oh, yes, we, you know, so it was. Pretty, pretty quick, as soon as you have this system, it, it goes very fast. Okay, so w with this kind of uh, needle reconstruction, does it save uh, dose and procedure time? Uh? Yeah, especially here, if you have to uh, perform an initial 3D, then if you plan to perform uh, a 3D to check the position of your needle, then you have to perform a lot of 3D acquisition. So at the end, you will have a procedure with, with a huge uh, radiation for the patient. So thanks to this stereo 3D, uh, if you are not very far from your uh, target point, you can use it and have uh, an assessment of your position without uh, radiation. Yeah, for, for this case, actually, you have put five needles. Yeah. So if you have done a 3D before and after each needle, yeah. at the end, you'll have at least 10 3Ds. And you showed, you, you, you just made three 3D acquisitions to have the, the, all the, the yeah. needle placed. Th that helps us a lot for, for this. So there's more irradiation than doing it under CT or under... City is probably very uh, uh, nice to have a, a visualization of the, 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 the anatomy and the screw uh, position, but uh, here we have a, a very comfortable environment because, as you can see, the, 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 the angulation of the, the needle are very steep and we wouldn't have the possibility to uh, puncture uh, to, to, to perform this kind of track under CT and to have the, the same visualization, real-time visualization of uh, uh, our needle uh, positioning.
Okay, uh, some other questions. Uh, what is the size of your room? So uh, our operating room is about, uh, I would say, 70 uh, um, square meters, mm. which is quite big. Uh, we have some space for, for this. I, I'm not sure it's really necessary to have a, such a big room. It is very comfortable to have it. Mm. Uh, the problem is still the, 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 the space around the patient because of the anesthesiologist, because of any kind of machine we can we could have some such as a, a radio frequency ablation uh, generator or so. But yeah, we have a quite a large room. And uh, what about you? In Marseille, we have uh, 45 meters square. And so it's uh, yeah, it's way worse. Yeah, well, clearly, if you are lucky to have 70 meters <laughs> square. <laughs> Um, questions. Uh, where are you anesthetist, uh, anesthetist uh, usually located in the room? Yeah. The left and the right? That, that's the really a, a key uh, question when you uh, uh, have this kind of room because of the rotation of uh, the C arm. You have to think about what kind of procedure you will uh, perform and where your anesthesiologist will, uh, will be located. I think. The best uh, w w is probably to have the anesthesiologist at the head and the right side of the patient, which is not what we have, uh, but probably it's 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 the best. What 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 is your? They are more located on the left uh, yeah. for the vascular because um, I think for all, all the cable uh, it's more easier, but. They can go on, on both sides and yeah. see. It. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting to have the fluids and everything being able to, to be on both sides. Actually, both sides, you yes. showed that you can work on the both sides yeah. of the of the table. So, depending on the case and the length of the yeah. case, it some kind of times and we do that. Sometimes we put them on the other side. Actually, not not that much, but it is feasible and it's interesting to be able to do that. But when uh, the the ball was not so wide. It was really yeah. more important. Now it's le less important. So, is there other questions? Uh, no. Uh, so, please, uh, can so now we are. Consider uh, putting the anesthesia at the feet. Sorry, say it again. I say, I say you should consider putting the anesthesiologist at the feet sometimes, depending upon what you have to do up at the head as well. Um, we had to do that a fair bit um, because our anesthesiologists were typically at the head on the left which is not great for the configuration of the C-arm, but with long enough cables and long enough tubes, they were able to accommodate it. And then you move them around to where it sits you, suits your procedure. Thank you. So now Dr. McLennan, uh, it's your lecture. Thank you. Today I'm going to talk about uh, how we use the advanced applications in imaging related to ultrasound from the Logic E10, um, in the interventional suite to enhance our ability to do a very large variety of interventional procedures. I'm going to talk about integration with um, the discovery unit, which we had when I was at the Cleveland Clinic, but also how the changes occurred when I moved to the University of Colorado uh, to um, an environment where I didn't have access to um, a GE discovery and how the uh, Logic E10 really allowed us to do procedures that otherwise I would have struggled to do. Uh, these are my disclosure. I sit on a couple of advisory boards and um, and have had some grant support from several companies for clinical trials. Um, over here, we'll talk a little bit about ultrasound fusion, needle guidance, and sort of the needle assist that exists within the integration with Discovery. But also, I'm going to talk really specifically at the end about how ultrasound has helped our department in Colorado. Um, this was our setup at um, the Cleveland Clinic. We had a um, discovery um, angio suite, um, and the um, Logic E9 was the ultrasound we were using at the time. It's about two, three years ago, before right before I moved. And the um, this little box right here is the magnet that sits right next to the patient and allows us to uh, use the fiducials to uh, coordinate the ultrasound image with 3D imaging on the ultrasound, as well as with cone beam CTs and the fluoro in the uh, Discovery Angio suite. Um, you can um, 
move the C arm anywhere you want to. And um, if you needed to do something with the C arm, you could move the magnet out and move it back in when you needed to. So, so this is what I'm talking about with ultrasound integration. Um, you know, this is a large mass in the liver, obviously, and you've got a CAT scan on the right-hand side of the screen, and this is the ultrasound on the left-hand side of the screen. And by fusing these two images together and registering them, um, you can track um, that which is visible on the ultrasound on graphics that are represented on the CT um, and vice versa. Um, this is a example of where the portal vein is. So this, you know, you can see you can match uh, this notch in the portal vein to the two images and really use it for, um, for guidance. Um, so when you have an integrated system like we had in Cleveland, um, this, this is sort of the workflow of how to use the cone beam CT and the ultrasound fusion in an efficient way. Um, you basically start with your pre-procedure 3D imaging CT, PET, MR, anything that you've got, you've got that volume acquisition. Um, and then you do a non-injected cone beam CT with this active tracker on. And um, if the patient uh, has the tracker on during the cone beam CT, it allows automatic fusion between the ultrasound and the cone beam CT. Um, and um, you don't really need the tracker on during the uh, 3D imaging that was done ahead of time, um, but it automatically uses the cone beam CT as a bridge to get you this fusion. Um, you can also do an injected cone beam CT um, to automatically fuse to the live ultrasound. The other thing I did sometimes when I was doing purely ablation procedures is and I, if I knew the patient was coming in, I would put the active tracker on during this 3D acquisition. And then that volume, um, when um, um, moved in through the system as well, would automatically register these, these two um, images together. And if you see any misregistrations, you can sort of pick a point um, like a portal vein notch or center of a mass and pick it on the CT and pick it on the ultrasound. And that's actually fairly easy to do. And I use, do that very commonly now when I, that I don't have the discovery system. Um, this is an ablation case just to show you sort of the example. So there's a mass here centrally that we're planning to ablate. Um, we we're going to do uh, taste ablation, went in, did chemoembolization had our 3D cone beam CT, and this is contrast enhanced because we were doing the, the taste ablation, um, and we could identify you know, needle guidance using the GE software on the Angio machine, and we've got our 3D imaging here. Um, and then when we um, match these enhanced images, cone beam CT post embolization to the ultrasound, you um, can look at the color and make sure you see the vessels and the mass on ultrasound and here's the mass on ct um, and everything follows with it and then you can actually put your needle probe into it using ultrasound and you can see this is the cone beam ct um, and this is the software that we used for uh, ablation planning using the imprint which is the microwave that i think um, Covidian uh, makes and is probably now marketed by, I think it's Medtronic. Um, and so the software allows you to, to draw a edge around the tumor and to see where your ablation zone is and make sure that they overlap. This software is actually present, can be entered into the ultrasound, so you don't actually need the separate computer that um, they provided with the imprint device. And this is the ablation uh, zone um, with the hypo attenuation after the on cone beams CT at the end after the ablation is done. So it's really nice for an ablation guidance procedure. Um, this is a case where we were doing a portal vein access. You've got this very large tumor. Um, and um, so we're trying to get into the liver to, uh, to do a portal vein so you can see the portal vein here mass here portal vein here everything's matching up notch to notch um, and the idea here was to try to use the needle guidance aspect of it um, 
there's two different systems. Um, and I can't, I always screw up the names of them, but one's virtue tracks and the other one is there. And there's another, I think E-Tracks is the other one. And the idea is, um, there's a cannula that's, I think made by Cisco and, you know, you sold, you know, with the GE equipment that, um, has a little fiber that goes down it and you can, um, use that, um, needle um through a guiding cannula um it can go um you can use an 18 gauge and, and put a, a like a 17 gauge over needle over it or a sh or a peel away sheath and when you use that needle you can actually track the tip of the needle and it goes uh, and you can track where it goes on the graphics on both the ct and on the um, ultrasound so even if you don't see anything on the ultrasound, you can actually see where the needle goes. And once the needle's there, you can use your over sheath to, to have your access, put a wire in and, and do what you need to do. You can also use it for ablation guidance directly. Um, so this was accessed into the portal vein and into the portal vein embolization. And you can sort of see all the angiograms and where the glue distributes and a very nice, you know, right-sided embolization. Um, and then on the GE system, we were able to sort of fuse the CT with our cone beam just to make sure we had everything covered that we wanted to cover and, you know, make sure we protected the segments and allowed growth. So at the University of Colorado, um, we are a very large footprint. We, um, we have seven angio rooms that we use as part of the CU Cardiovascular Center. We don't have any GE angio equipment in the department. And when I came, first thing to do was up to get a, a Logic E10 in because um, the usefulness of being able to integrate the 3D imaging into the IR suite for what we did was really critical because unlike in the Cleveland Clinic where there was an abdominal imaging section that did all of the biopsies, drains, and aspirations, the IR section at Anschutz does um, virtually every needle directed procedure that a radiologist would do, the only exception being some of the musculoskeletal stuff because we have an active musculoskeletal intervention section. But we do probably on the order of about 15 biopsies a day and 10, or somewhere between five and six drains or aspirations a day. So these small procedures that in many cases are ultrasound only procedures, um, you know, are very common and most things you can do with just a really good ultrasound, but there are times when you have um, difficult access and in, you know, in Europe, there are plenty of practices that do ultrasound only, but there, we use CT a lot and we only have access to the CT scanner about half the time during the week because we share it with musculoskeletal and neuroradiology for their procedures and there's really only one interventional scanner in the building. So, Getting the E10 was critical to being able to do certain very complicated cases, and it also speeds a lot of the simple stuff just because the quality of the ultrasound is really excellent. Um, so this is a case I'm gonna show, it's just an object case of a very simple, straightforward case we would do, you know, 50 times a year. Um, this is an abscess drainage in a patient with diverticulitis. And the reason I show this case is because the anatomy is a little difficult, um, it's not impossible to do this with CT. It's not impossible to do it with ultrasound only. But the idea is, can you enhance the safety of the procedure by making sure you don't hit vascular structures or bowel when you're doing needle placement? And this is the kind of thing that is applicable to virtually every practice that does any kind of intervention, whether it's you know diagnostic radiologists who are doing procedures you know 20% of the time, or, or or an interventional practice that uses um, the needle guidance aspect of the practice as a very big mainstay of what they do. So you can see there's all this in, wall thickening around the, the bowel, um, and uh, there was a colonic diverticulum. This is sort of a loop of sigmoid, and then there's this abscess right next to it, and then we have the iliac vessel right next to that. Um, so what we were able to do, this is sort of the needle guidance how-to with a different case. This was a tumor. We were doing any sort of matching them up and following the needle. And I had explained that in the other case, but you can track 
on your CAT scan and where you're going and uh, correlate it with the, with the ultrasound. So here is a case in which, you know, you can see the needle track here. There's the tip of my needle. Here's the tip of my needle, like right here at the muscular edge. Um, and you can see the abscess is right here. The bowel is here, the vessels here. And with color, I can demonstrate that that's where the vessel is. So I know I can stay medial to that. You don't really see this abscess very well. Um, because you've got overlying bowel and there's air right here, which is shadowing us out. Um, and it, and it sort of makes sense. And obviously things move around and there was a fair bit of peristalsis sort of over on this side of the screen during it. Um, so this is an example of the needle being advanced. Um, and you can follow the needle on the ultrasound. You can follow the needle on the CT. And I'm just trying to get into this collection right here. Okay. And once I'm there, I can put my wire in and then with the wire in, I was able to advance this um, abscess drain into the diverticular abscess. And so the point is that by setting this up and taking the five minutes to set the system up and fuse the images together with each other, um, I was able to do this abscess in a single puncture. Um, there was no, this was one puncture, the actual placement of the needle from the beginning to the end took less than a minute to do. Um, and it's because I had all the information I needed. And this here is the CAT scan that um, is of the drain in place. And you can see how the drain sort of snakes right next to the vessel and down right into the collection. And there's the, the drain sitting down there in the cul-de-sac. Um, so, you know, we did sinograms over time. She ended up you know, demonstrating that this abscess actually fistulized to the vagina. But over a period of about three or four months, that cleared up and we were able to actually remove this abscess drain. And this just shows you the images that they're all outside the bowel. And as it clears up and you pull it back, you know, the bowel becomes more normal. And, um, and you're able to resolve this. And she had her tube taken out, I think, about seven weeks after um, we placed that drain um, with really good conservative management. This is the kind of thing done in radiology departments every single day in the, in, in the world. Um, it's the kind of thing with inexpensive equipment um, and this kind of software, you can take the value of the 3D imaging and put it into the ultrasound itself. And in that way, you'll be able to enhance your practice and just do cases that you might otherwise say, I can't do that, has to be done surgically, or um, keeps you out of the CT scanner where um, you know imaging time is really valuable and sometimes fairly restricted because of the expense of the equipment and allows you to do things that with the ultrasound by itself that you might not otherwise do. All right, so in summary, you know, we use uh, image fusion to confirm our target. We use vessel overlay to speed the selection of an approach. Needle guidance can uh, limits the number of punctures. Um, and the ultrasound fusion allows us real-time needle placement. And the other thing that's nice is when you're doing ablations, you can overlay the ablation zones actually right on the ultrasound itself. And the fusion to functional imaging is really interesting. I've done this a fair bit with PET scans is, you know, biopsy that's failed several times. I can put the PET scan and the ultrasound together and I can demonstrate, look, my needle is right in the PET positive nodule. If you're not happy with this biopsy result, it's not going to get any better than this. And that's really helpful when we're talking to oncology. Um, so thank you very much and welcome to Colorado. <laughs> Dr. Mark Lennon, thank you for yeah. your presentations. Um, we are running a bit out of time, but we have a, one question. Um, what are the main improvements you see between the Logic E9 and the Logic E10 in your daily uh, practice? So, number one, actually, I think the ultrasound quality itself is pretty remarkable with the E10 versus the E9. The E9 was good, and it and it, it did well, and it as far as its soft tissue contrast. Um, it is my section's favorite ultrasound for delineating superficial soft tissue um, in our department. We have a lot of different ultrasound machines. Um, and I think that's just a indication of the generation of new ultrasound technology. Um, the, the Virtue Tracks and e -Tracks software is largely the same. Um, the steps necessary to 
fuse just an ultrasound with a 3D volume is actually much less than it was with the with the early E9s. Um, it's my techs all know how to load a 3D volume set into the ultrasound machine directly. It's done with Wi-Fi through to our packs. So it directly pulls it in. Um, and before the case even starts, the CT scan is in the machine. I can just click on an image, put it up. And then um, the other thing that's easy to do, which took a minute for me to figure out, was uh, if you push one of the, the like, uh, color buttons on the side, you can actually flip the CT around so that if you're doing a procedure prone, you can orient the CAT scan prone so it matches your fusion and uh, allows you to track the needle properly. So those are all things that have been big improvements in the in the E9 to the E10. Is uh, I think the software is easier to use. Um, it's actually really quick to fuse a 3D volume to the ultrasound with, if you're not going to use anything else. And we're actively trying to create spaces where we don't have angio equipment in them at all. Um, and we can do ultrasound only procedures for probably 30, 40% of the procedures we do. Because just the room turnaround time gets better. We can do eight or nine patients and even 10 or 12 patients in a day in a room like that. Whereas when we're using bigger equipment and moving people in and out of a recovery space, it's, it limits the number of cases per day. So. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. So we have to conclude the session. So thank you for all these uh, lectures. It was very, very interesting. And thank you uh, for, to General Electric for the organization. And thank you uh, to the audience to come and, and follow us. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.